I greet you all in the name of our Father, Friend, and Savior. A survey was done some years ago to find out people's number one fear. And after the survey was completed, they concluded that public speaking was the number one fear. Guess what was the number two fear people have? Death. So I can conclude from that that people will rather die than speaking in public. <laughs> I also have this fear of confined spaces. So I'll continually moving to remind myself, it's okay, it's okay, nobody's going to hurt you. <laughs> okay? So please forgive me if you see me walking up and down here. Friends, this morning, I have chosen the title Walking in Victory for our devotional hour this morning. Now, all of you know that when you start walking, you either have to exit something or you enter something. And if you were early, you would see that some of us entered in the wrong, on the wrong sides, you know. But be that as it may, for our call to worship this morning, I'm going to use a verse of Scripture very well known among the Adventist people in the book of Joshua chapter 24, and I'll be reading verse 15. I'll be reading the A part and the C part of that verse. I'll give you a moment to find the book of Joshua. It's in the Old Testament. And it reads, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. The sea part. But for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, today the choice is clear. We will serve our Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. In contemplating this service, and while studying or doing my studies for the sermon, I asked the Lord what to speak to His people about. Because you know Adventist people, I'm speaking to first, second, third, fourth generation Adventists. Lord, what do I speak to them about? Should I give them a generic Adventist message? And the Lord said, no. Should I give them an open door or a last cry message? And the Lord said, no. I want you to speak to them about obedience. I'm going to ask you to keep your Bibles open in the book of Joshua because we will reflect on Joshua chapter 3 this morning. Obedience to Jesus is essential to finding purpose and meaning in life. Peter in the book of Luke chapter 4 understood this when he followed Jesus. Likewise, Joshua came to understand the importance of obedience when he led the children of Israel into the promised land, friends. Both men found purpose in obedience. The aim of this service or this sermon is to encourage the hearers to obedience. Now the following letter was found in a baking powder tin wired to the handle of an old pump that offered the only hope of drinking water on a very long and seldom used trail across the Amagosa Desert in Nevada, USA. The letter says, This pump is all right as of June 1932. I put a new sucker washer into it, and it ought to last five years. But the washer dries out. And the pump has got to be primed. 
under the white rock just behind you. I buried a bottle of water out of the sun and cock end up. There is a, enough water to pump or to prime the pump, but not if you drink some first. Pour about one-fourth and let her soak to get the leather wet. Then pour the rest medium fast and pump like crazy. You'll get water. The, ne the well has never run dry. Have faith. When you get water, fill up the bottle and put it back like you found it for the next fella. Signed, Desert Pete. P.S. Don't go drinking the water first. Prime the pump with it, and you, you'll get all you can hold. Tell me, if you were a lonely traveler, shuffling down that parched desert trail with your water bottle bone dry, would you trust this guy? For all you know, he's a lunatic. <clears throat> What if it's a mad hoax? There are no guarantees to what he claims are true. And what would motivate you to prime the pump with the water in the bottle? Perhaps the only water available. But you understand the fact that all pumps have to be primed. Friends, it's a gamble. A risk. An adventure. What do you do? This story illustrates an important lesson. The lesson of before. The lonely traveler had to prime the pump before the water flowed. This lesson manifests itself in everyday life. There are battles before victories. There are struggles before celebrations. There are steps before arrivals. There is practice before perfection, friends. There is preparation before completion. There is matriculation before graduation. Amen. Over and over in Scripture, this pattern is repeated. The Israelites had to march to the Red Sea before God parted it. Naaman had to wash seven times in the water before God cured him of leprosy. Gideon had to reduce his army from 32,000 to 300 before God would deliver them from the Midianites. The loaves and fishes were given up before Jesus multiplied them. Peter had to obey Jesus to row out to the deep water before he caught a boatload of fish. This lesson is manifesting itself all over. But nowhere was this lesson of before more evident than when Joshua was preparing to lead the Hebrews into the promised land. After decades of wandering in the wilderness, and the children of Israel were purged on the banks of the Jordan, ready to cross over. In this narrative, the word crossing over were used 21 times. Please go count it. Don't just believe me. It marked a transition in their lives. The crossing over required a new faith experience. The before lesson applied here. In order for them to occupy the new land, God had waiting for them. They had to trust Him. Like in life, we have obstacles, friends. And one big obstacle stood in their way. 
the Jordan River. Do you have rivers standing in your way today? Flowing north to south. It stretches over 325 kilometers from Mount Hermon to down the Dead Sea, furiously plummeting from several hundred feet above sea level to approximately 400 meters below. Normally, the Jordan is not difficult to cross. It's, a narrow, and, it's narrow and shallow. It's a modest stream of water, the commentators will say. But when Joshua led the people, when Joshua led the people of Israel to the Jordan, it was spring. The snows had melted on Mount Hermon. No longer was this river mild and tame. The Jordan was now tempestuous, raging, and in flood. During the dry season, at its widest point, the Jordan was 30 meters wide. Now it was over 1.6 kilometers wide. The Israelites were at an impasse. The children of Israel came to this raging, impossible river. Like the lonely traveler, traveler on the Amagosa Desert Trail, spotting the water pump, reading the letter, their hopes were thwarted. They were so close, but yet so far. They were confronted with a test of faith. Many times the obstacles in our lives We'll just do that. Test our faith in who and what we believe, friends. But then, just like there is obstacles in life, oh yes, there are miracles in life. Never forget that. Yet here God performed a miracle that closely resembled the miracle of the Red Sea. Now my question, why the similarity? Why did he do it twice? Except for Joshua and Caleb, by the way. The Hebrew people were a new generation, or one generation removed from those who crossed over at the Red Sea. This young core of people had only heard about the great escape from Pharaoh's army. They had not witnessed it. And you see, friends, today in church, we see that same, or we find that same scenario. We get people entering our church, entering their Adventist church, removed from the heritage we have, from the upbringing we have from the stories we share. They were not present. So God did this for their sake. Just as he rolled back the waters of the Red Sea, he rolled back the waters of the Jordan. Just as the mothers and fathers walked across the bottom of the Red Sea on dry land, so too did their sons and daughters walk across a dry riverbed of the Jordan River. Did they need a miracle before they believed they could conquer the land? Did they need to see God's power demonstrated before they recognized Him as the living God? Did they need a new story of escape to tell their children before they had the courage to battle the giants of the land of Canaan? Did they need all that? Yes. And sometimes God will allow the same things to happen to us so that we can have a story for our children. And each generation will have their own stories about God's miracles, about God's goodness, friends. It is time that we start walking in faith. It is time that we start walking in victory.
the Hebrews experienced a miracle. They witnessed the visible demonstration of God's power. I, Adventist Church, what will you do if God perform a miracle like that in your presence? What will you do, church? Amen! <laughs> you can say that again. It feels good. I'm, I'm actually getting started now. They knew that the living God was among them. Church, do we know that God is here with us? Do we still feel his presence? Do we know he's here? Or is it a theological concept? A pie in the sky? A fairy tale? It was a great day of victory and celebration and arrival. It was an experience that they would share again and again and again. How often times do we experience miracles like that? Miracles that we can just share. And the more you share, the more power you get. This is not an ESCOM concept. The more you pay, the less you get, by the way. <laughs> Before the Hebrews experienced the miracle, witnessed the power, and saw the hand of God, there were requirements. Before this church can cross over to the promised land, there's requirements. And this is where obedience comes in. They had to prime the pump. In order, in other words, the people would experience the power of God, but they had to take the first step. The children or the Hebrew children had to wait. That was the requirement. They had to wait to consec consecrate and to take the first step of faith before God showed up. Did you catch that? They had to wait. They had to get themselves ready, consecrate themselves, and then take the first step before God showed up. If it's for me, tell them I'm not here. <laughs> Joshua chapter 3, 2 to 15, tells us that often we have to wait before moving ahead with God. The children of Israel did it. For 40 years they had waited while the entire generation died off. The promise had been deferred because of the unbelief of elders. Because of the unbelief of pastors, the promise was deferred. Are we going to wait for this generation to die off before we can enter the promised land? I think not. If the pastors and elders are unbelievers, kick them out. Kick them to the curb. Because this God requires obedience. We will finish this work in our generation. And now they would wait again with the destination in sight. Friends, I can see the promised land, can you? I can taste it. It's like electricity going through you. I can, I can reach out and touch the promised land. Can you? And friends, believe me, while standing on that bank of the Jordan, you couldn't keep them. They were definitely not happy campers. They could see there is the land of milk and honey. That is where I want to go. This world is not my home. I am just... Oh, yes. The church is getting there. You see, friends, no one likes to wait. By the way, I may not look like it. I am a very impatient person. I hate waiting. 
Waiting is not a strong suit for most of us. We tend to be the horn honking, microwaving, express mailing, fast food eating, and express lane shopping people. Amen? Yet sometimes God tells us, Anchors. Stop. Wait. Waiting is the hardest part of trusting, friends. It is the hardest part of trusting. It is the most arduous aspect of this lesson. We live by the promise. Don't just stand there. Do something. While God often says to us, don't just do something. Stand there. Too often we want God's resources, but we do not want God's timing. We forget that the work God is doing in us while we wait is as important as whatever we are waiting for. Waiting means that we give God the benefit of the doubt and knows. He knows what he's doing. Waiting is God's way of seeing if we will trust him before we move forward. Waiting reminds me that I am not in charge, friends. My mother is sitting here. Yeah. I hate driving with other people. They are the worst drivers on earth. There is only one excellent driver, and here's he standing. If I drive with anyone else, I, I'm a nervous wreck. By the way, they're planning to send us to Israel. Now, I've spent some time in the U.S. It was a 12-hour flight. I hate every minute of it because I was not the pilot. I'm not the one there with that stick in my hand. I get nervous because I... Did you see that Boeing 747 just passed us now? Did, you, did they see that pedestrian coming across the road? <sighs> My heart raced. <sighs> you know, I, I hate not being able to be in control. It seems like I'm the only abnormal person here. Waiting reminds me that I am not in control, friends. When we get to the crossing moment of life, we are not just waiting around. We are waiting for God. Therefore, we can trust His timing and His wisdom, friends. Verse 5 tells us of chapter 3. Always we have to consecrate before the blessing tomorrow. We have to consecrate today before the blessing. Then and now God calls his people to holiness. We don't want to hear these sermons anymore. We want the sermons that tell us, oh, everything is hunky-dory. Just as you are. You'll end up in a hotter place just as you are. God calls his people to holiness, friends. God calls his people to purity. How often do we speak to our young people? How often do we speak to our adults about purity? Purity is not a physical thing. It starts up here. God calls us to separation. He calls his people to holiness, to purity, and to separation. Separate yourself from the world. Separate yourself from the desires of this world. That's a whole different sermon. For the Israelites on the edge of the Jordan, this means or this meant washing themselves with water and practicing the ceremonial rites that would make them clean. They were to flush their minds of the filth and dirt that had accumulated over the years. How often times do we 
consecrate ourselves. Are we still in the habit of doing that? Cleaning all that filth out of our mind? They were to approach God with a pure heart, clean hands and feet and a blameless mind. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may enter in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. They were about to enter the holy land, God's country. Think about it. Every time in Scripture that God shows up, people were to recognize that place as holy. People took off their shoes. They fell prostrate in humility. When God said, consecrate yourself, it was his way of saying, only holy people will occupy this land. When God calls this church to purify itself, Friend, God is saying, I'm coming to get a holy people. It starts here. Don't believe those prophets that tell you holiness starts in heaven. It starts here. I would like to take a literary liberty. Hmm. May I insert the word today in this verse as it reads, Consecrate yourself today, because the Lord will do, will do wonders among you tomorrow. Joshua chapter 3 verse 5. Friends, I'm asking you, consecrate yourselves today. Tomorrow is Sabbath, for God will do wonders among you tomorrow. The need for holiness, purity, and separation comes before the blessings of tomorrow, not the other way around. We often believe that if God will bless, then we will get our lives right. God says, holiness precedes honor. Cleanliness comes before usefulness, penance before power. The promise that God would work miraculously tomorrow was contingent on God's, on his people's willingness to consecrate themselves today. Waiting speaks to God's schedule. Consecration addresses our sanctification. Then it deals with our steps. Before God would part the waters of the Jordan, a condition had to be met, a step of faith. Now the Jordan was at flood stage, the Bible says, all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priest who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the edge or the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing and it piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam, in the vicinity of Zerathon, while the water flowing down to the sea of Arabah or the Salt Sea was cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Joshua chapter 3, 15 and 16. Do you see the lesson, friend? Do you see the lesson? God promised that the current of the Jordan would be dammed up, but first the people had to step. Thank you. First, the people had to step into the water. God was ready, willing, and able to perform an amazing miracle, a feat that would prove that he was the living God. But the condition hinged on the people's faithfulness, friends. As the people marched forward somewhere along the way, God would intervene. They had to get their feet wet before God would act. Many times we say, the Lord will bless, while we sit with our hands folded. 
Many times God wants us to move and be the blessing before he intervenes. Isn't that just like God? He wants to do something amazing today. But before he does, oh sorry, he wants to do something amazing tomorrow. But before he does, he wants you to trust him today. We are required to demonstrate our faith. Like an electric eye opening door, it will open, only open when you move towards it. Isn't it so? Faith is a risky business. Kierkegaard, Soren Kierkegaard, in his biography, concluding unscientific proscript to the philo philosophical fragrance, whatever he, fragments he wrote, without risk, there is no faith. Without risk, this man wrote in his biography, there is no faith. For faith to be faith, we will venture out before our own abilities and resources. We take the step before God acts. Do you have an obstacle? Move forward. You know, as an Adventist church, we like to move around objects. We like to move around obstacles. And we become like the Israelites, wandering around. Move through it. And as you start moving through it, God will open it. Or remove it for you. Often God would provide, or often God provides no solutions to our problems until we trust him and move ahead. While he wants to supernaturally in intervene in the difficulties and challenges of our everyday lives, he can't until we first demonstrate our faith by walking forward on the path of obedience. Compared to God's part, our part is minuscule, but necessary. We don't have to do much, but we have to do something, Howard. We have to do something. The children of Israel saw God's work in a powerful way. The river stopped flowing, by the way. They walked through on dry ground. They were in the promised land. The river is about to stop flowing for this church. God wants to call you. Come in. Come enter into my rest. He's ready to do that. Are you ready to move forward as a church? Are you ready to move forward as a family? Are you ready to move forward as children of God? Friends, the time to decide is now. Choose you this day whom you will serve. For too long have we served. The demon of power, the demon of wealth, the demon of status, the demon of lust. For long have we served these demons? Choose you to this day whom you will serve. They walked through on dry ground. This lesson deals with our waiting, our consecration, and our faith. It plays out in my life in the following manner. When I take the risk of giving generously, I discover that I can really trust God to take care of me. But first, I have to get my feet wet. When I take the risk of asking forgiveness of another person, I discover that God will really honor my confession. But first, I have to get my feet wet. When I risk using my spiritual gifts, I can know the joy of being used by God, but first I have to get my feet wet. When I risk making a phone call or visiting to encourage or show concern, I know the satisfaction of touching another human being at their point of need 
But first, I have to get my feet wet. What are you doing? Are you getting your feet wet? Or are we comfortable on the banks of the Jordan? Have we become residents of this country? Because by the way, if you become a resident, you carry a green book called a passport. Are you a resident of this world? Or just a passerby? I do not have permanent residency, by the way. I'm an illegal alien, and I'm not from Zimbabwe. <laughs> I'm illegally in this country, in this world, and I'm moving through it because this is not my home. Where do you need to risk? How is God calling you to get your feet wet this morning? In conclusion... This is my only and last conclusion. There's not a conclusion following the conclusion. <laughs> Perhaps this time of the unknown is a test. The weary traveling, traveler reading Desert Pete's letter was put to the test. Would he prime the pump or drink the water? The Hebrew people on the banks of the Jordan were put to the test. Would they get their feet wet? Are you being faced with an obstacle, a challenge that seems impossible? Will you take the first step of faith today? God honors radical risk-taking faith. God relishes favoring people who apply this lesson in their lives. Today is your opportunity, friend. And if you want to publicly show, I invite you to stand with me today as we conclude this. Let's just bow our heads. My Savior and friend, I thank you this morning that you can be witness to this radical risk-taking faith. Father, we stand up and we say we had enough. We stand up and we say, Father, we want to consecrate ourselves today because tomorrow you will perform a great miracle in our lives. Father, today we're saying we consecrate ourselves because tomorrow we're going to take that step of faith. We are going to get our feet wet. Father, you have called us as a church, as an individual, as a nation. Go ye therefore. And today, Lord, we consecrate ourselves because tomorrow we will go. And we thank you for that opportunity. Open the doors for us. For we are coming in our numbers. I thank you, Jesus, for being with us. I thank you, Jesus, for caring for us. It is my prayer that you will reveal yourself on this camp meeting. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and keep you. Amen.